are very excited to have you. This has been a long time in process. I love this book because it's about desire. And I guess in some sense, everything is about desire. Um, it's called, here, here it is for our viewers. Uh, it's called Wanting, The Power of Mimetic Desire in Everyday Life. And you introduced this idea of mimesis, which sounds complicated, but we can get into it and hopefully it'll be digestible for people. In some sense, as far as I can tell, it's about the fact that we don't want what we want. We want what other people want. And it's this process of imitation that defines human desire. So we're dependent on other people in that really fundamental sense. There's a lot to talk about because you're drawing on the philosophy of a late French scholar, René Girard, who was a Stanford professor in his latter years. He's the one who really introduced and developed this idea of mimetic desire in considerable detail. He is pretty dense and difficult to read. So it's great to have someone like you who can share with the crowd um, what all this actually means. And the book is ambitious. And so you say in the introduction, the change you make is up to you, or at least it will be by the end of this book. That is... That is heavy. You're telling us basically that our lives could very well change once we understand these principles of desire and apply them in our own lives. There's a lot to talk about, but maybe just for the lay person, how should they think about mimetic desire and what does it actually mean? Yeah, well, thanks for the um, the intro, Shadi and Demir. Good to finally be with you. We We all live in D.C. Um, mere blocks from one another, but alas, we're, we're on Zoom today. Um, so good to be with you, and thanks for having the conversation. Um, well, let's just start off with what is mimesis. You know, mimesis is not a new idea or concept. Plato and Aristotle both spoke about it uh, thousands of years ago. Mimesis is a word that simply means imitation, but those philosophers spoke about it in the context of representation, um, namely in art, in, in music, in surface level forms of imitation, speech, you know, it's the basis of education. It's how we learn cultural norms. So it's no secret, you know, we've known for a long time that imitation plays a fundamental role in human life. Rene Girard's contribution to this discussion was his insight that imitation goes deeper than this imitation of representation or surface level things down to the layer of human desire. We actually imitate the desires of other people, even while thinking of ourselves, uh, especially since the, the enlightenment, we have this romantic idea of ourselves as being these highly autonomous, independent creatures who generate our own desires. You know, I want what I want because it's just simply, um, what Luke Burgess at his deepest core, his authentic self wants. And Gerard is saying, you know, wait a minute, we're social creatures. We live in a culture and in a context, and we are in some sense always mediating desires to one another, uh, whether we realize it's happening or not. And, you know, classical example of this, anybody with kids might recognize this and resonate with it. If you turn 10 toddlers loose in a room full of 10 toys, 10 toddlers, 10 toys. The toys are equally cool for the sake of argument. They will not each uh, pick up their own toy and entertain themselves. Inevitably, they will gravitate, gravitate towards the same one and begin to probably to fight over it, right? And to uh, actually reinforce one another's desire for the single toy. So, why that process of convergence of desire happens is at the heart of Girard's theory, and he called that mimetic desire. And it's, it's a theory of culture, and it's a complex theory. Some would say it's a theory of everything. This is one of the strongest critiques of Girard, is that he, he has like this really big theory of everything that actually claims to explain these hidden origins of human conflict and violence. And Girard's kind of paradoxical claim is that 
we fight because through mimetic desire, we come to want the same things. Even, you know, we think of ourselves as different, but we're, we're actually converging on one another's desires. Even people that we consider to be our rivals or our enemies, they too are in some way mediating our desires to us. And this goes back to the earliest pages of the Bible in the book of Genesis. You have, you know, Eve doesn't spontaneously get the, get the idea that the apple would be good to eat. That desire is suggested to her by the serpent. So she is in a sense imitating Cain and Abel, right? Um, they want the same thing. They want recognition and, they, and that brings them to conflict and, and the first murder. Um, and interestingly, you know, and that after that story of Cain and Abel, that the first city is founded. So Gerard links this primordial mimetic desire and conflict that stems from it to the formation of uh, culture in terms of prohibitions and rituals that we use in order to manage out of control mimetic desire. So I know that's a lot. You know, we, we can yeah. stay on any one of those aspects of the theory as much as we need to. But I wanted to kind of lay out the, the implications of this because they apply to everything from uh, relationships. You know, my wife and I talk about this all the time to politics, to economics, um, to culture itself, to, you know, the reasons why there are trends and bubbles in the stock market. Um, so that's that's why Gerard's theory attracted me. I mean, I, I not only saw its explanatory power in the world around me to explain things that seemed irrational. You know, so that it, there was this kind of uh, pre-rational uh, force of desire that did make a lot of things make sense. But more than anything, I saw it in my own life because I uh, am, a, am a mimetic creature like I think we all are. And I saw how easy it was for me to become fascinated by bright, shiny objects all around me through this process of mimesis that Gerard described so well. Yeah, so there is quite a bit here in this theory that I think lends itself to darkness. Um, there is the scapegoat mechanism, which you alluded to. And I think that it's interesting that Gerard has become more influential and more well-known in America in recent years, because I think people there is a lot of darkness in our political life and, and certainly the dark aspects of polarization. It is hard to understand polarization without some idea of desire and imitation. So I think it's very useful there, but it also makes me think that of Carl Schmidt, another, um, the Nazi jurist intellectual who has been influential with his friend enemy distinction. There are these dark ideas that have become in some sense rediscovered and popularized because they speak to our moment. Um, and I suppose one concern I have with this full, fully understanding mimetic desire and reading your book and reading Gerard's work um, to the extent that I have is it, you can use it for ill. You can use it to manipulate people. When you understand how mimetic desire works, in your everyday life, you can weaponize it. In the second half of your book, you try to turn more positive and you basically counsel people to not misuse this knowledge. But in a sense, you're giving us an entire framework to understand the world. I don't want to overstate matters, but it can, it can be a very powerful tool for understanding other human beings. But it is ultimately up to us to decide what we want to do with that knowledge. Yeah, I mean, isn't that, you know, the case with any knowledge, right, that it can be used for good or for ill, you know, um, you know, people have the agency to, to decide how they want to use that knowledge. And to the extent that you think that Gerard is putting his finger on something true about human nature and culture, then, you know, that can certainly be used for, um, you know, personal gain. Uh, I think there, there are people out there right now uh, who are, um, I would call it weaponizing mimesis, right? Who, who know this theory very well, who are saying things in just the right way to drive the maximum amount of outrage and fear and engagement. And some of them are becoming extraordinarily popular and wealthy within certain circles because of that weaponized mimesis. And I, I think that's a huge concern of mine. Gerard um, 
interestingly enough, he, he was full of these really evocative phrases that he would drop in all of his books and then never really explain what he meant by them. Um, he used this phrase in one of his very first books and he said, I'm a political, well, he didn't say he was, he was referring to um, the French novelist Stendhal and Flaubert and Tocqueville. And he referred to them as political atheists. Mm. And in a sense, it's what that phrase means is, is unclear. It's open up to interpretation. I've talked about this with a few of my friends, but um, he seemed to be implying that when you see the mimesis and when you start seeing that, you know, much of our politics is a giant imitation machine, it's just one reaction following another reaction. And when you can gain some critical distance from that and from, you know, the sort of the, the mob mentality, it is possible to opt out of the game that the people that weaponize mimesis want you to play, right? Because it benefits them or their personal brand or whatever. And I, I, I think Gerard was sort of using this term political atheist in a, in a positive sense, right? That maybe we need to believe a little bit less um, in some of these narratives and, and in the power of politics to solve all of our human problems, including, including you know, our limitations and sin, if you wanted to get theological about it. Um, so he, he always seemed to want to put things into perspective. You know, here's a force that I see in the world is what I, I hear him saying. Um, the more aware you are of it, um, the better. But it's still, people will, will still weaponize it. And the more that we are aware of it, and it seems like we're more aware of it than ever before. Um, I've never heard anybody talking so much about this force. You would naturally expect, actually, um, people to sort of try to hack it right and that's that's been that's been my worst fear right when i i go on podcasts and it's like well, what do we do with this with this knowledge how do i use it and that always makes me like kind of recoil because we we do live in this kind of world where we always as soon as we gain a piece of knowledge we want to learn what, what we can do with it to gain power or to you know to, to build wealth or whatever and it's like, well, maybe this is something that's very serious and we need to just let it sink in and understand the ways in which we're maybe unhealthily and mimetic in various ways in our relationships and in the way that we react and engage in dialogue and hopefully use that to uh, transform the way that we engage in, in, in our relationships. So, so Luke, you know, um, I, I, you, you alluded to it just now, you know, some people making gobs of money on this. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the interesting part of the book, and I'll, I'll, I'll fess up now to being far out enough out of the zeitgeist to not, uh, to not have picked up on this earlier until I read your book. Uh, it's, it's, you're talking about Silicon Valley. Um, you know, uh, you, you tell your story a little bit as, a, as an entrepreneur uh, of walking away from your, from, uh, from your, your, your baby and finding a kind of freedom to that, but then you return and, and you know your your discovery of Gerard um, is is tied up in the early in the books with uh, Peter Thiel, who I actually I've never read Zero to One, um, and I, I didn't know that he had uh, uh, he had a you know a, a sort of a, a mentee relationship. Did he study with him at Stanford? Is that is that part of it? Was he was he his student and, and disciple or? Just he he read and and, uh, and learned of him at Stanford. What what's the? Uh, no, they, they were at the Stanford. Background? They were at Stanford at the same time. As far as I know, Teal was never actually in Gerard's class, but Gerard mm -hmm. used to organize luncheons and small right. groups and sort of formed a community of disciples. And Peter was part of part of that. So I mean, you know, you 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 interviewed uh, Peter for this, and you know, you you talk about it a little bit more, uh, but but. Peter sort of disappears pretty early in the book, and then you, you, you go on to talk about how these, these, uh, these forces, this understanding, and I do want to really spend some time talking about transcending it because I, I, I think it's really interesting, and, but uh, you know, I'd like to push you on that because I, I, I find it sort of hard to wrap my head around. But going back to Silicon Valley and how uh, this theory has, has, has uh, you know, helped uh, Peter Thiel uh, sort of conceptualize the way he approaches things. 
Could you say a little bit more about that? Um, you know, Peter Thiel's sort of looms so large in the public imagination at this point as either uh, a heroic figure who's just seeing through all the bullshit or just some or a satanic figure who is who's figured it all out and, and we're and manipulating all of us. What, what do you think is the, the the main takeaway for him in how he's approached things uh, in, in learning uh, about how mimesis drives everything in our world? Well, a quick clarification. So, you know, my introduction to Gerard did not come from Peter Thiel, mm -hmm. even though I was moving in that world and, and in the startup world It came from uh, an old um, priest in the hills of Rome while I was on a silent retreat. So just to be clear, Gerard has a, a very broad uh, following, right, really worldwide. Um, I sort of connected with Thiel much later in the early stages of writing the book because I knew of the connection and I read Zero to One. And I was intrigued because I read Zero to One and I was like, this whole book seems to be speaking about mimetic theory and taking insights from Rene Girard, but never mentions Girard. It obviously has to be pulling these insights from Girard. So my initial reaction was like, what, what the hell? Like, I need to ask him, like, what, what's going on here? And, you know, it's true. I, and I think he wanted to write a book that didn't uh, make it seem like he was, you know, th that these ideas were overly reliant on one particular thinker. But it there's no mistake. I mean, it's heavily reliant on the ideas of Rene Girard. And, you know, he said when I talked to him that his decision to invest in Facebook was largely due to him seeing that there was this um, powerfully mimetic aspect to the way that Facebook worked. And I, I won't get in, into the, the specifics of that, but it, it, it almost seems like an engine built to maximize mimesis. Now, obviously, Mark Zuckerberg didn't uh, intend it to be one, but it, but Peter saw that it was. So he, he, you know, he sort of said, I invested, I bet on mimesis. Um, mm -hmm. In other words, I almost hear him saying, like, the mimesis is going to happen um, either way. Um, you know, I might as well bet on it and make money from it. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's so, you know, he, he, that was part of his decision-making process when, when he gave Zuckerberg his very first half a million dollars to, to invest in Facebook, you know, in that book, zero to one, he, he, I think he elaborates his, um, at least the way that he looks at economics, um, and how, you know, we can tend to, um, just be looking at the same things that everybody else is looking at and, and miss all kinds of opportunities. And I, this, you know, this, so he's, he's got his entrepreneur's hat on, right? And so many times, you know, entrepreneurs are just chasing the money. Uh, they see somebody else starting a particular uh, kind of company. Uh, you know, I don't know, they see Substack, you know, doing really well, helping people launch newsletters and all of a sudden there's a bunch of copycats. And, you know, that's sort of driven by some level of mimesis. So, you know, he, he definitely sees the, that mimesis is, is destroys value creation because it causes us to miss opportunities to build things that need to be built because, you know, we're, we're, we're not looking there. We're, we're just looking to our right and our left and following the crowd, following the herd. So from, from an economic growth standpoint, that's not optimal. Um, from a... You know, and, and there's all kinds of, you know, trickle down effects from mimesis and, and all kinds of other fields, right? Like even in research and you, know, you look at Alzheimer's research, um, there, there was all kinds of money and grants and, and things going to one specific hypothesis, right? For a particular protein in the brain that was thought to cause Alzheimer's for, for decades, most of the research and thinking revolved around the one thing and people weren't exploring other you know, other, other solutions, right. Or, or even looking at other ideas, right. So, you know, this, this happens in academia all the time. It happens in the economy. Um, and I would, uh, and I don't know what Peter's thinking, but I, I it probably happens in politics too. Right. Um, you know, we, we start, you know, once the conversation is direct, is sort of, um, demarcated along certain boundaries and lines, most people are afraid to talk about things that sort of don't, that, that, that fall outside of those, outside of those boundaries. And, you know, the people that admire him in that realm, I think, um, like that he is, seems willing to, um, to, 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 to go outside of the sort of mimetic 
uh, tracks in the snow and, and talk about other things for better or worse. I mean, whether you agree with them or not, that's what I, that's what I think he, he is doing when it comes to being aware of the, where the mimesis is flowing. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple examples that you raise in the book, just so listeners have a more clear sense of what this actually looks like in practice. You give the example of going to the bar and you had decided on your way to the bar that you wanted a cold beer, but your friend who's apparently like pretty cool and successful and I guess, you know, maybe makes more money or whatever, ordered a martini and then your desire literally shifted in real time and you felt a pull that you no longer wanted to order a beer, you wanted to order a martini. So I just wanted to mention that because that there are, it's like literally something that comes up in a lot of daily, uh, daily activities, but also some more fascinating ones that I was only vaguely familiar with. There was something called the dancing plague in the 1500s where this young woman just started dancing in a really weird way somewhere in Italy and people thought she was crazy, but then more and more people started following her dancing in this weird way and it spread like an infection. And then I don't know if this quite fits in, but it's, it's definitely an episode that I was, that I find fascinating and also very frightening where something called the downtown project that happened in Nevada, where um, three people who were involved in the project committed suicide back to back to back. I don't know if that is an example of, I get if that's mimesis per se, but anyway, those are just three things that really stood out to me because they're just remarkable when you think about them, maybe not the martini one, but certainly the other two. Um, and I'm curious if you want to just say something about this, about how suicide can spread, because it also makes me think of a novel that I'm, I'm reading right now, The Virgin Suicides, which is fiction. I don't think this something like this has ever really happened, but where five sisters commit suicide in, in rapid succession. I'm sure there, I mean, five seems like a bit much to happen in one family, but the fact that something in a novel can actually be replicated in real life, at least to some extent, is really interesting. But I think what was happening in this novel, The Virgin Suicides by Jeffrey Eugenides, I think that's how you pronounce his last name, but one sister sees the other sister, like there's a kind of modeling and then you follow. And anyway, there's a lot there, but I I'd just be curious how you would take any of those examples and maybe expand on them. Yeah. You know, the, the martini example, um, what I, I call the mimetic martini. I mean, at any bar you go to, um, and you see somebody order a martini almost in, invariably like one other person at that bar is, is going to order a second one. <laughs> um, I, it seems trivial, but there's an important point to make there. And it's how the stories that we tell ourselves about why we changed our mind. And this is how mimetic desire works. You know, it's never, oh, I'm, you know, I'm operating on mimetic desire. So I'm going to get a martini too. It never sounds like that or feels like that. Uh, what happens is I say, it's very common to hear somebody say, oh, I, I didn't realize that I wanted a martini until I heard you order one. I just realized that that's, that's actually what sounded good to me. I don't know why I thought of beer as if, you know, I, I, that is what I wanted the whole time or something like that. And I just needed to hear you order it before me. That's exactly what Gerard calls the romantic lie, right? The romantic lie that our, our, our desires are, there's kind of a, a straight line between us and the things that we want. And I just needed a reminder from you that I wanted the martini. What's, what's in fact happening is that I didn't want a martini. I wanted a beer and, and it, my desire changed based on, based on yours. So it's, it seems like a trivial example, but it's, it's, most people can relate to this kind of thing happening it, when it comes to, uh, you know, food, drinks, uh, uh, romantic interests are, are, are very often mediated to us by, by other people in terms of the strength of our attraction to people, right? So, you know, love, love triangles. I mean, this has been a very old story. The greatest novels that have ever been written are about the way that various actors influence the desire of other people for other people. 
the on the suicide example, I mean, I think this is a, uh, an important thing to talk about because uh, it, there does seem to be evidence that uh, suicide is um, mimetic in some way, that they seem to cluster in uh, certain uh, geographic locations, friend groups. And, you know, that raises some serious questions about the way that they're covered in the media. Um, and I, I would say the same thing about school shootings. I mean, like, why, 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 why is this? You know, this, this is a this this is a relatively new phenomenon, and the mimesis seems to be in, in increasing, right? It's it's troubling, um, and it, it's it would seem that some things are more powerfully mimetic than other things, and there's been some studies that have that have been done on social media. Uh, specifically on the social media named Weibo in in China, which is basically their version of Twitter, and they they found that uh, angry tweets uh, they're not called tweets on, on that platform. I don't know what they're called, but the but the, the angry statements, yeah, are they spread um, much faster than sentiments like gratitude or joy uh, or, or, or things like that? So it seems that conflict. Um, violence, anger, um, these dark forces, for whatever reason, uh, tend to be more powerfully mimetic in some way. And, I, and this is why I think, you know, evil itself is, um, it, we have to be very careful with, you, know, you have to be careful about having a fascination with it because it's so powerfully uh, mimetic, you know? Um, so, I, I, uh, you know, I, I, I and, this goes back to kind of the weaponized mimesis example that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation. Um, if, if it's true that that is highly mimetic, then it's no wonder that it drives more engagement than the people that are out there actually trying to have difficult conversations with people. I, I just hasten to throw in, uh, you know, all the furor over, over uh, transgender issues and the sort of, you know, the concerns about, about uh, young people just copying and how, you know, statistics show it seems to cluster. I don't follow this stuff very closely, so I'm not going to wade into it and get in trouble over something that's just not really uh, central to my life. But, um, but yeah, just throw that out as another, as a, as another uh, example. Luke, you know, the, the thing that, that struck me especially about the beer example um, and you just mentioned how Gerard um, characterizes it uh, as this romantic idea, uh, you know, romantic idea of the self and 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 and, uh, and desire that there's a straight line. The what jumps out at me there, and it's something that I think we can probe to get to the second half of the book, is is the question of uh, free will. Uh, is the question of uh, you know just how how that works. In you know Gerard's framework, also in your framework, uh, which is you know Gerard inspired, but I think you know you've made it your own, and 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 some of the uh, the the uh, the conclusions you come to in the in the second half of the book. What's what's how how free are we? Um, obviously, we can be driven to copy, and I, you know one of the the features of the book is you talk about how to understand mimesis and also how to you know try and break out of these sort of loops. But I think it'd be just interesting to, to get you to talk about sort of, you know, I don't know, not to get all highfalutin about it, but how, what's the metaphysics of, of sort of the individual and the individual's choice and will? Um, obviously, there's something ingrained in our, uh, a lot of our enlightenment ideas, quite frankly, about this, this unconstrained free will that, that, you know, we are rational actors at the core. That is what, what makes us and, and therefore, that 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 we will choices, and that is our will. Now, again, that's not necessarily in any conflict with mimesis. It might be something that influences how we will something. And you know, you have these charts about you know the the uh, that it's through these models of of of, of uh, that we try to emulate that that influences our choices. But but talk a little bit about that. Uh, how how free are we? Hmm. Well, freedom, you know, freedom exists on a uh, freedom is not a static thing. You know, like I have the same amount of freedom at all times in my life. Right. I, I in my opinion, I can uh, gain or, or lose freedom depending on the choices that I make. You know, um, you know, if I if I drink a lot every day, I'm less free to not have that next one. Right. It's kind of the way that addiction works. So 
you know, if you if you sort of transfer that over to to just lo- other domains of life, I think the same kind of principle holds. Um, we can be more or or less free, and I believe that we can uh, at least in understanding mimetic behavior and gaining some critical distance from it, we can be more intentional about the kinds of actions that that we're taking, rather than getting caught up in a kind of a mimetic movement. I think of mimesis like physics. I, it's, for me, this is the best mental model, you know, almost like getting caught in a riptide when you're, you know, swimming in the ocean. Um, you know, there are certain things that you can do when you're in a riptide that will um, help you, like, you know, actually counterintuitively, like not trying to swim your way out of it against it and sort of, you know, resting and waiting, right, and not reacting right away. Um, and I think the same is true with, with kind of social m- mimesis as well. Um, so many people sort of buy into the romantic lie that what they're doing, um, they arrived at that decision completely uh, sort of in- independently. So there are, and there are also different kinds of freedom in my view. You know, there's, there's physical freedom. You know, if you're in prison, you you physical limitations. You're not totally free to go wherever you want. There's psychological freedom. And at the deepest layer, I would say that there's such a thing as spiritual freedom, which is related to, to self-possession. You know, there's some people that seem self-possessed to the point where they can be in a room full of people or, or a, uh, you know, in an angry in part of an angry discourse. And for whatever reason they they, um, it's it's not inevitable that they will sort of need need to, uh, to to imitate everybody else, right? Where there's some other people that seem like they it's almost like they can't help themselves. And it, I wonder if there's a there's a difference in the level of freedom there. Uh, the, the, when I think of this in the context of things like uh, cancel culture, I think one of the the most salient examples for me is the example that Gerard himself talks about. And I think this is analogous to some of the things that we see in our world today. He talks about the act of a, of, of a literal ritual stoning, which happened all the time in the ancient world and, and unfortunately still does in some parts of the world today. And he talks about that as a mimetic process. And I think understanding that as a mimetic process is, is really important, sort of understanding freedom. So, you know, he asked the question, he says, well, why is the first stone so important? What is it about the first stone? And it's a very famous story in the Bible about this, you know, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. Well, what is it about the first stone? The first stone is the only one that doesn't have a model. It has no model. Nothing has been cast before it. Um, therefore, it takes more intentionality to cast the first stone. Um, The second stone has one model and the third two and so forth. And there's less and less intentionality that would seem to be required the more stones that have already been thrown. However, um, it is possible for a person to halt that sort of mimetic process. Um, And in the, in the story in the Bible, it was halted, right? It was halted by Christ. Um, and I, I, I have to believe that it's possible to act um, in a way that is not deterministic, right? I, I don't believe that one need, need be mimetic, right? That it is possible to, to be a part of a situation like that and to choose intentionally and with more reason and rationality uh, in that situation. Now, the re- one reason that people don't is... First of all, they, they could be completely uh, sort of caught up in the, in the riptide and in the mimesis. But a, a second and maybe equally, if not more important reason, is that they're very often turned into scapegoats because they're the only one who, who stands apart. And now they've set themselves apart and now they're noticeable, right? They're, they're different. They're interrupting the process that everybody else wants to, to occur. So you know, very often people just stay quiet and they, and they shut up because it's easier and it, and it's safer. Um, in the whole second half of the book, I am actually arguing for, I know that many people don't question whether there is such a thing as free will. Um, I am arguing that, uh, we do have agency. We can lose, we can lose a lot of it. Technology may be, um, eroding our agency in many respects. 
uh, if I spend 18 hours a day on my on Twitter, I think I, I develop Twitter brain and I probably do forget how to uh, speak to another person and have, you know, a discourse like this. Um, but uh, I wouldn't have written the book and I wouldn't be speaking about this uh, the way that I am if I didn't think that it was possible to, to actually change our behaviors once we know what's going on. So I don't know if you guys know this, but I was actually the victim of the scapegoat mechanism on Sunday. I do. I, I did, did not, not know that, Shadi. Do you us. know what happened on Tell. Sunday? The Eagles were, were playing. You <laughs> oh, know about no. the Here Eagles or a football team? I, 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 let me just say, let me just say, uh, I think our dear listeners know this. Luke, you may know Shadi's from Philadelphia. And he hates sports. And I, all I know, <laughs> let me let me tell a little side story about this. First, all I know about Philadelphia is that Philadelphia people are rabid, rabid about their teams. That's the only thing I know about Philadelphia. Uh, the only other thing I know is I got a text, Shadi, from uh, oh. a, a, a mutual acquaintance of ours that linked to a tweet of yours, and he said, uh, "Have me on the podcast." Uh, and I'll explain something, something to Shadi. I'm at the game right now. And I saw the text and I went to click and your tweet was deleted. So clearly you had got, <laughs> I, I just took from that, that you had taken some, that you had said something uh, anti-Eagles or something along the lines of, I'm, uh, you know, I don't understand what you, you people are on, on about. And you must have gotten railroaded by your countrymen. Uh, and yeah. so you deleted the tweet. Uh, in order for greater acceptance, and then watch the game is from what I can tell. You're trying to like understand what football is about. What what part of that I get that wrong from my deductive reasoning there? Yeah, I mean to <laughs> to um, to humor the crowds, um, but it was more than that. I wanted to make a good faith effort to show that I was repentant. <laughs> I took a picture of myself watching the Eagles game on my laptop, and I apologized to the people of Philadelphia for my sins. Anyway, what I did, I did you put the Eagles jersey on though, Sean? No, God forbid. No, no. Let's not go overboard <laughs> you need a here. Hat. Birthday. But <laughs> what I what I basically, you know, I said something along the lines. I was in Philly on Sunday and it bothered me seeing all these people with Eagles jerseys. There's just something oh my about God. <laughs> I don't want to say too much, but I I tweeted something out saying like, you know, this is vaguely annoying to see people and I made <laughs> Oh I made some God. reference to football as a sport where people hit each other with helmets. Oh, my God. And uh, there was a lot packed into the tweet, and it went viral. <laughs> I think it before I deleted it, I think it had reached more than a million impressions on Twitter. And the sports media in Philly got a hold of it, and they were just oh like, yeah, like Barstool Philly and Barstool Sports, which has a massive following, were like, who is this person? This might be the worst take ever and stuff like that anyway like Wait, i and Shad, then, Shadi, were you intentionally weaponizing the mises there for engagement <laughs> you must have known <laughs> well so i hadn't well, actually started reading mises, your right? book trying until to be, <laughs> yeah you're trying trying to be trying to be a, an independent minded leader but brought brought to heel by the mob it looks like but yeah, anyway exactly. go on Shadi. but yeah. i think i think conformity also has its has its benefits like in retrospect i can have that feeling there was no reason for me to share that with the whole world on Twitter, like it just didn't serve any purpose. And that's also what my mom told me afterwards. And I think I have to be more careful about this. But basically, I think that Philly fans, including people who like would never follow someone like me on Twitter, I'm getting all these messages on Insta on Twitter from these Eagles fans. And they're just like, like saying really mean things to me. And I think that they were able to coalesce around me as a scapegoat and there was something almost um cathartic in that process so i that's my sense of how the scapegoat mechanism works but this was and more it worked of like because a, the eagles won you were expelled yeah from, expelled. from your from your home city <laughs> and and uh having having expelled a, a a person like you the eagles triumphed yeah yeah that's one way of looking at it but i guess what i also like to get to maybe one of my potential criticisms of the idea of emetic desire is there are, there are examples of the scapegoat mechanism in our own lives. And I just mentioned one, but they're not as dark as, I mean, at least in the, in the context of a liberal democracy, such as ours here in the U S 
you'd think that with mimetic desire and the darkness that's sort of implicit and explicit in Gerard's theory, that we would see more physical manifestations of evil. We would see violence spreading like a wildfire. But I actually think that it's somewhat remarkable how nonviolent America is, relatively speaking, despite the fact that we apparently as Americans hate each other so much and have these profound disagreements about foundational questions, we don't actually see violence spreading like a contagion. And we don't see the scapegoat mechanism actually turning into um, something real. Like, you know, as bad as it is to be attacked on Twitter or cancel culture, whatever, these are not examples of mass killing. So clearly there's something about our civilizational progress, at least in America or other Western democracies, where a mimetic desire has been constrained and channeled and institutionalized in ways that make it much more manageable. So I just, I just wonder that if, if the theory really, I mean, obviously we can point to all these examples of mimetic desire, but it's not as bad as Gerard might have suggested, I think, in some of his in some of his work. And I'm just curious how you would, how you would respond to that. Mm. Yeah, I should, I'm a, I'm a proud football fan myself and uh, of the Detroit lions, which is even worse than the, than the, than the <laughs> Eagles. Um, well, Gerard would say, this goes back to the very beginning of the conversation that I, I think you're absolutely right, Shadi, that we have a lot of mechanisms in place that constrain um, violence and conflict, um, you know, getting a Twitter mob or getting canceled on Twitter, uh, relatively speaking, is not that bad of a thing to have to endure compared to what might have happened to you a few hundred years ago. So Girard said that our culture, uh, the formation of institutions and prohibitions, um, even sports, all of these things are mechanisms that are that came into existence in order to mitigate the most destructive effects of mimetic conflict and rivalry, right? And this is this is a really important point. Like our our institutions um, are there to prevent conflict, and they're important. Um, they're not perfect, but these institutions serve a, a we, we rarely talk about them in terms of preventing um, mimesis, but Gerard would say that's one of the things that they do. He would even go so far as to say that perhaps even sports is a ritual that exists to prevent some form of conflict that we would have if it didn't exist. So, uh, you know, you could even say if, if the NFL ceased to exist overnight, maybe there'd be more violence. And, and in fact, that sort of did happen. Uh, by the way, a couple of years ago, you know, so we, you wait, know, it didn't wait that. So, okay. Wait, wait just a second here. <laughs> that happened. Yeah. I mean, there were no games being played. Oh, because of the pandemic in, in, in so 2020, no... because, because of the pandemic. Yeah. But I mean, that's a causation correlation issue. I mean, no. we don't necessarily, yeah. and there were spikes no, no, in I, crime I'm... everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So my, my, my point is that he, Gerard, thought that cultural institutions and rituals and prohibitions were born sort of out of a desire to, to, for self-preservation, right? That humanity is preserving itself from what used to happen, which would be all-out Hobbesian wars of all against all, mimetic conflict, and, and scapegoats, right, in the horrific kind that, that were very different than what happened to you. So I'm sure I was making sort of a joke about the NFL or that. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, no, yeah, it's not, um, I'm not, I'm not making a real serious argument there. Right. But, you know, in it's general, possible, he would consider sports as an institution that is maybe more important than we think it is. This is Shadi's next Atlantic think piece. Now that he's discovering football and he'll, he'll, he'll do the sociological study to figure, figure out the correlation between crime and sports. No, but, but so, Look, um, the 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 thing that that I keep coming to is, uh, you know, Luke. I don't know. I, I'm I'm a pessimist, and and you know, you even earlier said about people questioning free will. I remember in in undergraduate, I I took a 
a class on free will and just came away just, I don't know, really unconvinced with everything that was that all the theorizing that that needed to be there for free will. And honestly, the way way the way I end up on it is that, you know, you really you can you can you can slice and dice that stuff really finely unless you really do believe in a um a soul uh and define that as as an actor and just stop there there, there you, you can't really you know i think uh get to an explanation of free will that makes sense at least i think rigorously i've i've never been able to do it not that i'm a you know professional philosopher i really delved more than a semester into this stuff but that that's that's sort of something that i came away with and it's that's that's um, well, in a way, haunted me, but also shaped me ever ever since that that sort of thing. And so, as a result, when I write and like when Shadi and I fight about stuff, um, it ends up being that I I generally take what would be I think uh, charitably described as a sociological approach rather than an individualistic moralistic approach to any problem. And so, you know, the the first part of your book and and that part of Gerard actually resonates quite a lot with me because I think it's a, it's a good theory of sociology. It tells us how groups work, how societies are structured, what you were just saying, institutions for mitigating violence, for uh, channeling violence, for socially useful ends, um, an understanding of human psychology, of human group psychology, how these things interact. Um, but, uh, and, you know, at the same time, I'm, 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 I say this far too frequently on the podcast, I'm not actually a sociopath. I, 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 uh, um, I, I understand that you have to behave and not even understand. I mean, I do behave as if I have free will. You can't, you can't exist in modern society without that being operationally wired into your brain. Even as you study things, study phenomena and, and just conclude that, that a lot of it boils down to these larger social phenomena. And so I guess that, that gets me to sort of start pushing on the, on the, second part of the book, which is very optimistic, well, very optimistic, optimistic, I think optimistic in ways that, that, um, that I'm not sure I could follow you all the way on. Um, and it gets back to that question of, of free will and, and, you know, how much, how much can we transcend these, these large social um, uh, forces, uh, these institutions, these, these habits, um, these uh, psychological human realities uh, in order to uh, get out of it. Now, look, I mean, I would say that obviously, you know, there are exceptional individuals that end up leading. You have a chapter on leadership there. That, so leadership exists. There's a way to, to uh, change course and make a difference, if you will. I, I think on the margins to, to reshape things. But I guess my, my question to you with a sort of long-winded wind-up is how optimistic are you about really fundama fundamental changes on this? You, you end up talking about, you know, that, that uh, you, you had this uh, – that, that capitalism was one way to try and sort of uh, channel these forces into, into a more productive thing, but that, that maybe we need something else to get us out of um, uh, this mimetic loop – that we find ourselves in these forces that shape us and, and channel us and maybe make us destructive in, in, in ways. Demir, um, Demir, if, if I could just push you on this point. Yeah, before, go ahead. I mean, isn't your objection a little bit deeper? I mean, I think one of maybe one of your potential issues with, uh, with the book and, and maybe this way of thinking is you don't necessarily believe in self-improvement. So yeah, you're very true. skeptical. Is that fair to say? Well, I mean, I, it gets to what I was getting at with free will, and I, I, I think that's a good way to put it. Is is that it? And and this is, I guess, also the question of of you know to Luke to you about about the the power of will to sort of transcend these sorts of things. Is it just a question of awareness, and then making a decision to break with something, which then will have cascading effects? that would be profound enough to take us out of the broad doom loop? I guess that's my question. Um, so, sure. So, uh, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, just to um, 
put my cards on the table. I mean, this, the, that I'm coming from a Christian worldview, right? And, mm-hmm. um, Gerard's much of Gerard's thinking on this topic, especially his initial sort of insight into mimetic desire was around conversion. Why do people have conversions, right? Why did people in first century Palestine radically alter their lives? Um, he, but he used conversion in a broad sense. He, he spoke about literary conversions. You know, why did, you know, you look at the early Dostoevsky versus the late, um, you know, something seemed to have happened to him. You have a much humble writer that seemed to, you know, understand that, you know, there are not good characters and bad, just sort of not good people and bad people, right? The line dividing good and evil cuts through the human heart. Um, what Something happened to change him. And he, he describes it using this broad word conversion. Now, wh- why do people change? You know, um, it, you know, can, should that be attributed to sociological factors, to environmental factors? Um, wh- why, why do people change? Right. So I think that without um, I mean, with, from a purely materialist kind of view of the world and the, and the human person, um, I don't think I think it's very difficult to square this, right? I mean, because you, you're right, you, you said you have to sort of posit something that goes beyond the material to really even begin to have a kind of conversation about the about the will, just in general, right? And, and to the extent that there's free will, um, it doesn't make sense if we're operating on a sort of purely um, kind of uh, uh, instinctual basis, right? It seems like we, if you, you know, we have to be able to transcend our instincts, whether that's through our intellect, or whether it's through something else like grace from a Christian perspective. So, you know, Gerard would say that that maybe that's what's responsible for the change in a person. It's, it's something, you know, supernatural. Um, interesting kind of, you know, so, so is transcendence possible? Is, is change possible? Uh, just recently, this, this is a striking example for me as I've been thinking about change and I've been thinking about this phrase of, political atheism and, and looking at the polarization of our country and, you know, how people can get trapped. Uh, people seem less open to change, to changing their minds, to, uh, you know, to marrying people of a different political party. Um, you're just, we're just not seeing them. You look at the difference between even the 1960s and today, it's radically different, right? So wh- why is that happening? And I was reading, um, I was reading the Inferno, I was reading Dante's Inferno over these last couple of weeks. And in Canto 10, this really interesting thing happens. So Dante comes to the sixth circle of hell, and he's told by Virgil that these are the arch heretics. And you've got some arch heretics that are in this flaming sarcophagus. They're trapped in a tomb, burning up in flames for all eternity, right? And he said, these are the arch heretics that are in this tomb. And he said, they're Epicureans. They don't believe in the immortality of the soul because they're so they're Epicureans. That's all we know about them. And then they start to engage in this discussion. One one of them, Ferinata, pops up from the coffin, pops up from the tomb. He recognizes Dante's Florentine accent and he said, Ah, you, you're from my city. And then they have a little conversation and he recognizes Dante from being from the rival political party. Um, Ferinata is a Ghibelline and Dante is a Gulf. And he recognizes him and he said, Ah, your people were my father's rivals and my ancestors rivals and therefore you're my rival and he's sort of you know caught um and they just have a discussion about politics and he still you know he uh he he died before dante was even born so he's he's talking about things that happened a long time ago um and it's interesting because here they are having he's supposed to be a heretic or they're not having a conversation about theology or religion at all they're just having a conversation about being from rival political factions. The connection there is the, the way that I read that, the heresy is precisely, and this is Dante, so he's, the, he has this very Thomistic worldview. The heresy is precisely um, that he was trapped in an imminent uh, political framework, and he didn't believe there was anything that transcended politics, therefore, or, or his political party, right? So it was, an, it was a disordered attachment and unwavering loyalty to a political political party that 
to be honest, didn't even no, no longer existed in its current form by the time he and Dante are having this conversation. He wouldn't have even recognized it if he had the ability to see the present, which nobody in, in Dante's hell does. They, they can't see the present. So it was his unbelief, his rejection of the belief that there was anything that transcended politics. Um, in other words, he believed all of his belief was in the politics as a solution for everything. And there I, there I think is an example of somebody that's kind of a stark example. Um, somebody who did not believe that there was it was even there was even a possibility of, of of transcending and therefore was kind of condemned to you know just just relive the same old political ar arguments for forever um, but I, I I bring that up because we we did talk about we sort of you know you mentioned you know you have to what if you don't sort of uh, have a worldview in which there's something that transcends the material or the physical then I think that that's the second half of the book, the the transcend the, the transcending the mimetic loops, the being able to make a decision that could be anti mimetic, um, is much it's much harder if not impossible to get there. So I'm agreeing with you on that, and I think that we, there are some metaphysical presuppositions that are important when we're having these kinds of discussions. <laughs>